Today's webinar is brought to you by the uh, Catholic Charities USA Parish Social Ministry Leadership Team. My name is Allison Cavazos. I am a member of the CCUSA PSN Leadership Team. And before we really get started with our content, I want to just go over a few quick housekeeping items to get started. So first of all, this webinar is being recorded. You can revisit it at a later date. Uh, it will be a permanent resource for members of uh, parish social ministers, for your Catholic Charities agencies to reflect back on. The phone lines are currently being muted so that we can all better hear the presenters. However, you may use the chat feature or raise your hand if you have comments or questions. We will have a specific time near the end of the presentation for questions and answers. Um, you can submit your questions at that time. We also have our presenters who have generously offered that in the event that we do not wrap up um, finishing up the questions at 2 p.m., that is a solid stop time, but some of them have agreed to remain on the line for just a few more minutes in case you have additional questions, and we will also receive their contact information. The Catholic Charities Parish Social Ministry Leadership Team uh, is a section of Catholic Charities USA, an association that provides networking opportunities, resources, and skill development for parish social ministry professionals, both at Catholic Charities agencies, at our parishes, and other community partners engaged in social ministry, with a focus on strengthening our overall capacity to build a more just society. We are responsible for producing webinars such as this one, participating in the Catholic Charities Annual Gathering, providing continuing education opportunity, as well as newsletters and other printed resources for you. Today, I am joined by our wonderful presenters, Daniel Sturm, who is the Research and Evaluation Manager at Migration and Refugee Services for the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, as well as Jim Koo, our Senior Director of Immigration and Refugee Services for Catholic Charities USA. Following their presentations, we will be uh, joined by some special guests who have experience working with these topics in the parishes and in the Catholic Charities agencies. Camille Pickinky and Tom Fox from Catholic Charities of Northeast Kansas. And as we begin, let us remember that everything we do is to build the kingdom here on earth. So please join me in prayer. Merciful God, we pray for families and individuals who have left or fled their homes, seeking safer and better lives. We lift up to you their hopes, fears, and needs, that they may be protected on their journeys, their dignity and rights may be honored and upheld, and they may be welcomed with open arms into generous and compassionate communities. Amen. Jim, I will turn it over to you to get us started. Okay, well, thank you, Allison. Uh, by way of introduction, I want to just take a few minutes to touch briefly on what the Catholic Church has historically taught concerning migration, because that's really the backdrop against wh which we do our work in the parishes and other Catholic institutions. Uh, parishes here in the U.S. and throughout the world have been in the vanguard of welcoming newcomers for centuries uh, and incorporating them into the life of the community, perhaps more than any other institution, I would say. Uh, the spirit of hospitality, uh, welcome as we call it more today, is deeply rooted in Scripture in both the Old and the New Testaments, which tell compelling accounts of refugees who are forced to flee because of oppression. Exodus, for example, tells the story of the Israelites who were victims of slavery in Egypt. For 40 years, they lived as wanderers with no homeland of their own until God fulfilled his promise and settled them in the land that they could finally call their home. The New Testament recounts in Matthew's gospel, the Holy Families escaped into Egypt because of the harm that King Herod wanted to bring to Jesus, who himself became a refugee. In the same gospel, Jesus in turn reiterates the Old Testament command to love and care for the strangers, as he says in Matthew 25, for I was a stranger and you welcome me. So from this scriptural foundation, then, the Catholic Church has articulated the five principles that you see before you on migration. First, persons have the right to find opportunities in their homeland. 
all persons have the right to find in their countries the economic, political, and social opportunities to live in dignity and achieve a full life through the use of their God-given gifts. In this context, work that provides just living wage is a basic human need. Second, persons have the right to migrate to support themselves and their families. The church recognizes that all the goods of the earth belong to all people. When persons cannot find employment in their country of origin to support themselves and their families, they have the right to find work elsewhere in order to survive. Sovereign nations should provide ways to accommodate this right. Now, this is not an exclusive right. So this brings us to the third point, that sovereign nations have the right to control their borders. At the same time, the church recognizes the right of sovereign nations to control their territories. However, and it's a big caveat, a country's regulation of its borders and control of immigration must be governed by concern for all people and by mercy and justice. A nation may not simply decide that it wants to provide for its own people and no others. In other words, not America and only America, or America first, as we're hearing. Fourth, refugees and asylum seekers should be afforded protection. Those who flee wars and persecution should be protected by the global community. This requires, at a minimum, that migrants have a right to claim refugee status without being detained indefinitely or pushed back or, and to have their claims fully considered by a competent authority. Migration policy that allows people to live here and contribute to society for years, but refuses to offer them the opportunity to achieve legal status does not serve the common good. Finally, the human dignity and human rights of undocumented migrants should be respected. Regardless of their legal status, migrants like all persons possess inherent human dignity that should be respected. A developed nation's right to limit immigration must be based on justice, mercy, and the common good, not solely on self-interest. Moreover, immigration policy ought to take into account the, the preeminence of family unity over other considerations. So what have the popes and bishops said, in, in particularly more recently? Suffice it to say that both popes and bishops have had much to say on migration throughout the centuries for a very long time. But in more recent times, I want to focus on, say, the last 20 years, what have they, what have they been saying? So in the annual message of the Holy Father for World Day of Migrants and Refugee Observances, going back, say, for the last 25 years, these are regular reminders of the teaching on migration. Uh, and all of these, by the way, can be found on the Vatican uh, website uh, if, if you want to go back and look at those, uh, particularly with the most recent one, which is for 2018. In Pope John Paul II, uh, 1999 exhortation called Ecclesia in America, he further refined and reinforced the, the migration themes of these messages. And among many things, he stated, and I quote, migrants should be met with a hospitable and welcoming attitude, always due regard for their freedom and their specific cultural identity. What have the bishops of the United States said about migration? So on the heels of the Ecclesia in America, in 2001, the U.S. bishops issued their own welcoming the stranger among us unity and diversity pastoral statement, seeking to continue the unity and diversity vision that was articulated by John Paul and his call to conversion, communion, and solidarity. It points to the presence of people of so many different cultures and religions throughout the United States and challenges us as a church to become a visible sign of unity and reject the anti-immigrant and nativist stance that continues in too many of our communities. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> Within the church itself, no longer should ethnic communities live side by side within parishes, but rather in connection with one another. So that's an important consideration. And finally, in 20, uh, 2003, the U.S. bishops released a joint pastoral letter on migration with the bishops of Mexico, which is really kind of a historic moment that had not been done in the past in this particular uh, pastoral letter was entitled strangers no longer together on the journey of hope in, the, in this historic letter they hearken back to the five guiding principles that we mentioned a moment ago by acknowledging the le legitimate role of the u.s government to enforce immigration laws but in so doing they must protect the human rights and dignity of all migrants 
with particular regard to the most vulnerable, the migrants, including refugees, asylees, and unaccompanied children. Out of this was born the USCCB Justice for Immigrants campaign in 2005. So you can see a direct uh, U.S. bishop response to that that continues to this day, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Parish toolkits and other practical resources related to these pastoral documents are still available at the USCCB website. So why are parishes so important to providing welcome to immigrants and refugees? There are over 16,000 parishes in the United States. Uh, the opportunities for parish involvement, therefore, are enormous. Parishes have long been and will continue to be vital partners in immigrant and refugee integration, participation, and empowerment. It's the a parish as a core institution outside the family in which Catholics participate in the life of the church. And the success of the church as an integrating and empowering institution depends in large measure on the success of its parishes. I don't have to tell that to any of you that know um, and have seen the, the changes that have taken place in, the, in parishes in the last 20 years or more. Many of these parishes also have schools and a variety of outreach ministries, so their reach is even wider. Parishes reflect the new demographic reality. So what does this encounter look like in the parish? As I said a moment ago, all of us have seen the research and observed the changing demographic trends in our nation and the church regarding newcomers and the growing presence in our parishes and Catholic institutions. There was a recent report by the Center for Migration Study based on a couple of surveys, and, and one was done among Catholic social and charitable institutions, and one was among parishes and Catholic schools. And they concluded that although Catholic institutions remain very robust, their future success will increasingly depend on newcomers to our country. That cannot be uh, overstated. Of almost 68 million U.S. Catholics, 15 million are foreign born, according to a study conducted this year by the Center for uh, Implied Research in the Apostolate by Georgetown University. That number is rapidly increasing. So how are parishes already responding? The good news is that the church continues to undergo this dread, dramatic transformation in its composition, while most dioceses have incorporated the intentional welcoming of migrants and refugees as an integral part of their parish and ethnic social ministry strategies. Parishes are playing an ever increasing role in educating their broader community about issues affecting migrants and refugees through community events, talks in schools and other venues, working with elected officials in the advocacy arena, and more. They also seek to bring together newcomer and native-born communities and promote cultural competency through presentation activities and cultural events. So that said, parishes still ex experience resistance. It is a, you know, uh, change is not a comfortable thing for any of us to adapt to. So. Despite the gains, the biggest challenge is most often the receiving community and the resistance to migrants and refugees. Uh, uh, sadly enough, even within parish leadership and parishioners themselves. So this campaign uh, that we'll be talking about, the Share the Journey campaign, uh, more and more, can therefore be a very helpful resource and tool for bishops, pastors, pastoral and parish ministry directors ethnic ministry directors and other leaders as they engage the Catholic faithful to create a place of welcome for all newcomers. I want to mention just two uh, campaigns very quickly, uh, and particularly the Share the Journey campaign in the interest of time. Uh, the Justice for Immigrants campaign, the second campaign mentioned there, is actually, as I mentioned, goes back 12 years now and came out of the Strangers No Longer uh, pastoral letter and really has two pronged uh, uh, focus or objectives. One, to create receptivity in the hearts and minds of Catholics and others of goodwill about immigrants and refugees. And two, to help shape and influence the political debate about the need for comprehensive immigration reform. So you can see both of these objectives are just as relevant today as they were at the time when the JFI campaign was conceived back in 2005. So uh, focusing particularly on the Share the Journey campaign, um, 
um, most of you are, should be uh, fairly familiar with this at this point. The, the rollout of that cane campaign happened on September 27th, and this is a brand new campaign and really a global effort that's been led by Caritas Internationalis, Internationalis headquartered in Rome, and which represents a confederation of over 160 so-called Caritas members worldwide. You can think of Caritas loosely as equivalent to a Catholic Charities organization. So Catholic Charities USA, Catholic Relief Services, and the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops are all Caritas member agencies, so-called Caritas North America. And as such, these organizations and their networks were invited earlier this year to be the U.S. face of the campaign. So you've, you've been hearing more and more, and hopefully many of you have heard from your bishops and others about the campaign or are actually starting to be engaged in that campaign. The genesis of the campaign goes back over two years when it was decided that a global migration campaign was needed because of the unprecedented levels of migration and displacement of over 65 million persons worldwide, including among them 22 million refugees. At the same time, Pope Francis has been speaking about the culture of encounter to combat a culture of indifference. He's repeatedly underscored and personally modeled the importance of encounter as a primary means of breaking down walls and dispelling fear and suspicion that's so prevalent in our current environment. We know how easy it is to fear or reject what we don't understand. It's really been exciting to see the wave of strong support and activity mobilizing around the campaign by the bishops, Catholic Charities agencies, parishes, and other supporters throughout the wide range of Catholic institutions. In fact, another uh, just a little infomercial here, there uh, will be a, a webinar, and this will be a topic of that, which we'll host during National Migration Week in early January to highlight some of the great things that are going on. So uh, more details will follow. Be looking for that in the future. So real quickly, what are some of the key opportunities in the coming months to promote the campaign? This is where parishes can be very vitally uh, important as partners. You know, of course, every day parishes are encouraged to make the campaign part of their, uh, their, their, their very essence in terms of the things that they do. But these are some of the milestones that you see before you that give us kind of markers that we can look forward to over the next six months opportunities to really promote the uh, the objectives of the campaign. First, of course, is Advent, which we just had the uh, uh, first Sunday of Advent this past Sunday. So, uh, you know, this is obviously, there's no better time to highlight the migrant and refugee story as embodied in the Holy Family. So you'll see things like Las Posadas and Our Lady of Guadalupe celebrations popping up here in this month. And these are great ways to to, uh, to celebrate the, uh, the, the newcomers among us. National Migration Week is an annual observance that was established by the U.S. bishops almost 35 years ago, continues to be observed, and that uh, the next uh, celebration will be January 7th through 13th, 2018, with the uh, theme of Many Journeys, One Family. So hopefully many, if not most of you, have seen the toolkit that USCCB has developed for that. If not, if you go up, go on the USCCB website and under the Migration Refugee Services Department or Ju Justice for Immigrants, uh, that is available. Uh, first time that this has happened, this is exciting, in the Nine Days for Life, which is obviously devoted to the pro-life uh, cause, one of the days will be actually focused on migration. I'm not sure which one that is, but if you follow that, particular observance, uh, you'll note that one of those days is devoted to the nexus between migration and the life issue, which are obviously very connected. Uh, there's the International Day of Prayer to end uh, human trafficking. That's uh, been established on February 8th and tied to the feast day of St. Josephine Bakita, who was a, I believe, a, um, a Sudanese slave who was trafficked. And uh, so in honor of her and to commemorate and to um, call attention to the victims of human trafficking. That day has been set aside as an international day of prayer. And finally, the World Refugee Day, which is a U UN international observance on June 20th each year to call attention to the plight of the more than 22 million refugees worldwide. 
I want to conclude my section of the uh, presentation with an excerpt from Pope Francis's World Day of Migrants and Refugees Days message in which he writes, every stranger who knocks at our door is an opportunity for an encounter with Jesus Christ, who identifies with the welcomed and rejected strangers of every age. This is a great responsibility which the church intends to share with all believers and men and women of goodwill who are called to respond to the many challenges of contemporary migration with generosity, promptness, wisdom, and foresight, each according to their own abilities. At this point, I'll turn it over to Daniel Sturm to share some of the very successful models of parish engagement in welcoming newcomers. Thank you very much, Jim, uh, for this uh, empowering um, introduction, uh, thinking about the demographic analysis you shared with us. Uh, so there's a lot of potential here, um, and also for setting the stage for, you know, kind of framing the world of crisis that we're in. Um, this is, of course, something in full disclosure, I have to say, that has particularly hit us hard here at the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, Migration and Refugee Services uh, in the refugee program where I am in. Because as you all know, reading the headlines, uh, the refugee program, you know, we've seen large reductions of refugee arrivals this last year, and it's not going to look much better this coming year. However, um, um, with that said, um, I do want to say that there's a bright spot here, and, and in that sense, that's called the POWER program. What is the POWER program, which I want to share with you the next couple of minutes? Uh, POWER is not just the button on your computer or the, uh, the on and off button on your TV set. It is the catchy name for parishes organized to welcome refugees. And um, so the, the refugee now is in question right now in the, and ironically in this time of huge global migration crisis here in the u.s we are seeing a really significantly decreasing number of refugees um, when the power program was started back in 2010 the idea was that we were going to bolster existing diocesan refugee resettlement programs um, through the help and with the help of parishes and community groups that are matching refugees with parishioners and mentors and raise awareness for the refugee cause, empower refugees and increase community integration. Of course, um, we've never technically limited this program to serving refugees only. We really don't distinguish uh, newcomers that way. Um, and we've always encouraged all of our programs to um, you know, serve asylees, victims of human trafficking, um, Cuban Haitian refugees, uh, unaccompanied minors. Uh, there's no shortage of those uh, immigrant groups either. And um, so that as a sort of like a little preface here, um, we are, this is a small grants program that's being administered on an annual basis. We're making roughly 20 grants available to reception and placement refugee programs that are diocesan based 90% uh, of the cases Catholic charities agencies um, but um, we, do, we are aware of the fact of decreasing refugee numbers and we are but we're building in the utmost level of flexibility for our programs to use the power resource quite creatively to um, weather this storm and to um, build up program capacity in building bridges to parishes utilizing this to recruit more and more parish-based volunteers and community-based volunteers. Uh, next slide, please. Um, yeah, with that, I want to just um, show some pretty pictures, um, give you an idea of what, of course, comes to mind when you're thinking about how can you actually, as a parish, as a parishioner, quickly get involved with, you know, uh, offering tangible help uh, this is a wonderful, visually quite appealing project in um, Portland, Oregon, where a, um, um, the children of Cuban um, refugees launched a project that's called Butterfly Boxes. And those are basically um, supply kits and supply boxes for newly arrived refugees and other newcomers with some important um, um, foodstuffs, food items, and um, 
household items that they need um, during the first few months um, in this new country. Um, very, very nice. And this was just from a summer potluck party that they organized in, in Portland. Uh, pretty pictures. Uh, next slide, please. So I, I want to want to expand a little bit even beyond what Jim said in terms of you know what is our parish capacity, and highlight the importance of volunteering um, as a as a concept. Um, really, this is, this is, has been a lifesaver for us this last year. I can I can I know for sure looking at our data, um, without the contribution of parish and other volunteers there would be no refugee program. Um, and more generally speaking, more than 64 million people in the United States volunteer on a daily basis, which is just an astounding figure when you think about it. So with this in mind, it's really time to reflect how well our organizations, that is uh, our Catholic Charities organizations, our parishes, how well are, are we really utilizing volunteers the sky is the limit here, really, um, and, and I've, I've seen this happen with the power program, but really, in some instances, there were like maybe one or two receptive parishes, parishes that have been engaged in this effort at the end of the period of one or two years of administering the power program, uh, we were able to generate some great successes in that they were able to expand the number of parishes involved with refugee welcome and newcomer welcome. So volunteering really equals power. Next slide, please. So in the next few minutes, I wanna just lay out um, a summary of some of the most promising models I have seen um, in the so seven years that I've been managing the Parishes Organized to Welcome Refugees program. And um, I'm, while I'm calling them models, they're really promising practices. Um, but most of these models really stand for a concept that's used by many of now 52 of our diocesan resettlement programs have uh, been participating in this power program. And, and you can kind of capture their approaches by using those models. Um, and they're just really, uh, in a nutshell, um, and, and I'm just using some really good examples, um, not to say that there are many other models, but this is sort of what I've seen as the, the um, broad brush um, um, general models. The first model really is a, um, the parish sponsorship model. So this is a very tangible way for a parish to, to get involved with helping newcomers. So this was, for instance, uh, implemented the Catholic Charities in Chicago, um, where the parish sponsor, in less than seven months, um, established nine parish partnerships, or that was actually the Catholic Charities partner, um, funded through the Power Program, established nine parish partnerships and obtained 52,000 in monetary contribution. This was averaging 5,800 per parish. Over the same period we recruited, um, or the, so the program reported, 124 volunteers who contributed a total of 5,675 volunteer hours. So these are astounding numbers. And um, really, um, if you if you click on, I know this is not interactive, but um, uh, if you if you look up this example, you can click on the link. And uh, the parish itself set up a social media presence or a website and documenting the steps involved with making this effort happen, um, like small interviews with uh, newcomer families describing the various efforts um, where they, um, you know, provided tutoring, provided English language training, and um, rental assistance and cash. Next slide, please. The second model, um, and that's probably by, by far the most easy to accomplish and easy to, and the most tangible one, the one that comes to mind when you're thinking about uh, your own experience, um, you know, you've all had in, interactions with newcomers. How can you most effectively, uh, most efficiently get involved with lending a help, lending your hand to uh, lending help to newcomers? Uh, this model, uh, this tutoring and, and English language training. This model uh, implemented with Catholic Charities in Louisville. Um, the um, the parish sponsor or the volunteer 
commits to a weekly two-hour visit with her family. Um, you in, in that meeting, you focus on English practice or cultural competency lessons, the curricula of which um, are shared with you um, through the case manager, the power program manager. You, you meet with the caseworker first to talk about the newcomer family's needs. You meet with the family and interpreter to introduce yourself and you submit monthly hours to the power volunteer manager and then you refer any problems to the caseworker. So um, this is a classic example where um, really the, um, the resettlement office plays a role and that there is a liaison component in that case the caseworker that really is, is your go-to person in, in, in you know wherever there are questions um, um, and interpretation questions particularly um, where you need that kind of connection. Um, they also produced a very nice uh, PowerPoint presentation that um, basically prepares volunteers for that experience, explains in a nutshell what refugees go through in their two to three years of, um, you know, from the camps to getting registered with the UNHCR to going through the various security screening processes, eventually um, uh, making flight reservations and uh, coming to the United States. Next slide, please. So the third model um, is sort of closely interrelated, but I think it's worth mentioning as something that really fits the parish um, uh, social ministry model. I call it family mentoring, um, family ministry of sorts. You know, this is more we're taking a family-based approach within parish um, ministry implemented as Catholic Community Services in Anchorage, um, where I feel like that was, to me, the best example. There are many examples I could pull out of the hat and just highlighting some of the more promising practices, but there are probably dozens of, of such um, efforts that are also being shared on a, um, we have a shared uh, My Membership website where we're sharing and exchanging and trading thoughts. So this one I liked because um, this power program developed a three-part volunteer manual um, in which um, really all the steps are documented. Volunteers learn about resettlement, how to become family mentors, what tasks are involved with becoming a mentor. There are like extensive lists included of the kinds of um, items newcomers uh, need, the kinds of uh, English language learning tools. Um, that are available for free online. The second volume describes the duties of the warm meals committees. So this is broken up into topical areas of need. You know, there's a family mentor component. There's a component where uh, families sign up to provide warm meals. Um, they're in charge of providing warm meals or groceries for newcomers. And the third volume covers the task of the transportation committees, which provide transportation to and from special events and doctor's appointments. So this can be done in, in small groups. It can be done uh, in the setting of families. It can be done in, this, in the format of parish um, uh, newcomer committees. Uh, there are many different uh, um, models that exist, but I think um, it would be worth taking a look at some of these manuals that have been developed so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. And um, I think at the end of the webinar, we will all share contact info, and I'm more than happy to share um, those manuals with you if your parish is interested in actually replicating that model. We have existing tools that are ready for use, and we can share those with you. Next slide, please. Um, the fourth model um, was, and I should say, uh, well received not only by our various community partners, the parishes, but also by um, the federal the federal funding um, agencies involved, and they are still seeing this power program as even even in light of the fact that you know um, currently the administration isn't necessarily the most hospital to, to new newcomers really, um, but the the private effort that the Catholic Church is making, the effort uh, that we are standing by this mission of welcoming the stranger is being seen and is being recognized as, as significant. So um, so in that, in that light, I should say that I want to highlight the idea of ambassadorship programs. Um, 
kind of like a mentorship approach implemented at Catholic Charities in Indianapolis, Indiana. Um, a partnership between power and Catholic high schools is another really great example of the energizing effect of this program. So, so the idea here was that the, the volunteers and this specific example, the students, serve as refugee ambassadors and receive service learning credits. So I think that's kind of cool, a little bit unique, um, different from the other, you know, mentor mentoring approaches that in that the students really become, they get like a passport, they become very close and that they really learn about the refugee experience through kind of the academic training that they're getting in their high school and, and through the outreach that the refugee program is doing. Um, and at the same time, they get the sense that they're really, that they're really being important here, and they are like setting up donation drives for refugees. Um, they are uh, also learning, of course, along the lines about the plight of refugees, and um, and they're actually and the refugees are are, are gaining, of course, uh, valuable in kind contributions. And um, yeah, so that that's a really great program, also ready for replication. Uh, if you'd like to to look into this uh, in in conjunction with working with your Catholic high schools or or other high schools. Next slide, please. Um, fifth model is um, what I call raising awareness, um, implemented at Catholic Charities in Jacksonville, Florida. This local power program developed a set of one-hour lesson plans for grades K through 12 to promote students' awareness of violence and human rights abuses. Students are given time to reflect on their own lives as well as the Holy Family and the plight of refugees. The goal is that students will learn to appreciate their own blessings, nourish their family lives, and share their gifts with our brothers and sisters in need. Um, this is a really great curriculum also has been shared with us. Um, um, Jacksonville has shared that with us. A curriculum is available for replication, adaptation in your own uh, parishes or dieties. Next slide, please. Yeah, and with that, I want to sort of like wrap it up with those final slides, you know, that's illustrating the really tremendously uh, positive impact and significance of volunteering in um, refugee settlement. Over the seven years that I've managed the program, we have seen the 52 um, uh, diocesan resettlement offices recruit and retain 14,500 new volunteers. We've been able to form more than 1,000 new parish and community partnerships and created um, new services, mentoring programs, tackling transportation, housing, jobs, food, language, legal, and healthcare issues. Um, next slide, please. Uh, just quickly, there are two resources available that are fairly brand new or fresh off the press. Um, one of which is called the Parish Refugee Resettlement Ministry. It's kind of a manual that looks into the um, basically where we are coming from, uh, why are we doing this, um, how can we actually go about implementing power in the parish settings, um, and it can very much be used as a train-the-trainer approach. Um, this is available online. Second resource is kind of a more like a nuts and bolts resource that um, describes the power program from A to Z and covers some of those promising practices beyond the, the five models that I shared with you. Um, a few more examples of the kinds of activities that, uh, that you might wish to develop. Also, I should say, just as an additional um, um, closing the loop to Jim's earlier presentation, power program activities are highlighted on the Share the Journey website. You'll find them under resources. You'll find, uh, I think, five to six or seven activities, um, um, including like some of the curricula that have been developed in welcoming um, refugees and newcomers. With that, I want to turn it over to um, the interactive radio style interview section of um, this webinar. Um, Camille, are you here? Yes, I am. Uh, I'm going to introduce um, Camille Pekinki from uh, Catholic Charities of Northeast Kansas. Um, you see her picture there and Tom Fox. Um, so Camille is the Parish and Community Outreach Coordinator and Tom is the Grants Manager at Catholic Charities of Northeast Kansas. 
Um, Camille, um, so um, Kansas has been participating in the power program last year and has some really innovative and very um, uh, good work related to engaging parishes. Um, Camille, can you just tell us in a nutshell what your approach has been in involving parish volunteers and welcoming refugees and immigrants? Absolutely. So um, my role at Catholic Charities um, is to really just work with our parishes and community groups, you know, year round for with a variety of programs. Um, and one way, so we basically go into parishes or community groups or even schools and we'll um, do curriculum pieces or just engage them in different um, activities that they can do um, to participate um, in service because um, it's our gospel mandate to really um, to serve, and that means everything from um, clothing the naked, feeding the hungry, and you know welcoming the refugees in, at this point. So um, we have just really reached out to our parishes that we had already had prior engagement with, and just um, shared them shared with them the new ideas that um, we and the you know the gift that we were given with the power grant to able to um, go out and educate in our parishes about what it means to welcome the stranger. I think everyone's already doing that in their parishes in some capacities, you know, with hospitality um, and just having like welcome committees with, you know, new parish members and stuff like that. So I think they're already doing it on a certain scale, but we're just um, asking them to maybe reach out a little bit more and um, welcoming those who are, you know, obviously not native to the United States who are, you know, making their new home in Kansas, you know, in our case, Kansas City. Um, and so, like I said, um, just re-engaging them and just sharing with them um, the purpose and the mission. You know, we're all one human family um, and we all have basic human dignity and rights. And so whether it's by way of um, personal phone calls or parish bulletins or um, just any kind of contact that we have with anybody who's slightly interested, we just kind of pounce on that a little bit and see what, where it takes us. Wonderful. Um, can you give us some examples, like how the, the this power program has benefited newcomers? Um, I know you've had some successes. Maybe give like an example or two. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we not only do we want to engage parishes in our metro area, but we also have um, we are part of 21 counties of Northeast Kansas. So we have a lot of um, rural communities that um, also wanted to get involved. So uh, I guess one of the um, success stories or just God's providence, I think a little bit of both, is that um, one of our parishes, um, it's like two hours away, and the one of the furthest counties that we live in, just a really small, dinky, dinky parish, um, they were, they reached out to us and they um, heard about um, that we resettle refugees at Catholic Charities, and they were interested in hearing how refugees got here and the process and what our role is at Catholic Charities. And they wanted to do like a household item drive for for Catholic Charities. So I jumped in my vehicle and took the two hour drive and did a presentation with a small group of um, individuals there. And I came back with um, a carload full of items, household items that we were in need of for um, our resettlement program. So what we do is we have a warehouse space where we set up little pods um, so we can set up basically household um, seven different you know apartments so tables chairs basic necessities and we were low on some of those basic necessities that we move move in on move it families in with so um, so I came back with one car load full and I had to go back for round two so that just proved to be a huge success for us um, and just really just you know what are those needs that we um, have and how can we um, tap into parishes, like I said, like this little community up in, you know, Northeast Kansas who um, just wanted to get involved and just had the courage to reach out to us. So that's one um, way um, in which we really have engaged a parish, um, especially with our refugee uh, placement program. But then also um, we um, have a program that's called New Roots for Refugees. So it's um, a guard, uh, farm training program, basically. So what our refugee program does, we have a garden plot 
that um, we are able to take refugees who are farmers in their native country um, and teach them how to farm and market their produce in the Kansas City area. And then at the end of their four-year program, what um, hopefully they're able to do is not only um, have the skills to market and grow um, here in Kansas, um, but also to um, maybe build or buy their own you know, small plot themselves so they continue to you know, be self-sufficient. Um, so one of the things that we kind of did, um, we had heard an idea um, from I think somewhere in like on the East Coast about um, supper clubs. And what's kind of cool about that is it really, um, we kind of capitalized on that. It's, you know, a gal decides, or an individual decides to host like a small gathering at their house and invite some guests. And they each have to pay a, a fee. Um, but the, all the proceeds go to supporting a refugee uh, farmer who comes for the evening and comes into the home of the, uh, the, the gal who is um, hosting and um, they cook a native dish to their um, country and we have an interpreter you know to help with some of those language barriers and then you know share their story and that takes I think it takes um, welcoming the stranger to a whole other level because you're inviting them into your own home and um, with your friend with you know the friend group that's there and then the money that everyone um, pitched in helps go uh, gets given to the refugee who made who made that meal that night so it can help them with maybe some of their rent or utility bills or maybe it helps them buy you know seeds for their you know next year's crop or whatever it is so i mean i hope i answered your question a little bit of some of the things that um we've done in a variety of ways that's wonderful um thank you for that i i'm thinking those examples are great to showcase the uh, really positive impact um of volunteer work also i think i remember reading even that uh, the um, you know the kinds of like a lot of the power programs are very very good at then you know utilizing the outcomes of their programs to their advantage and going out to you know to their communities and saying well this is what we accomplished and we have generated so much parish and community volunteer support that they can successfully then, you know, apply for other grants and such. I'm not sure if that was the case in in, in Kansas, but um, but I, you know, I think the the, I mean, this is just really impressive what you've done there. Um, question though about the you know about the negative, um, we, should, we should focus it on the positive, right? But <laughs> um, have you? Mm -hmm. um, we do hear this, of course, um, that, that not all parishes are sold, or not all, all parish priests, or the community at large are they're not all on board. Have you encountered um, any negative sentiments about newcomers, and uh, can you share some strategies as to how you have overcome them? I personally haven't a whole lot with my uh, the work with I have with parishes, or at least they've kept their opinions very quiet. Um, I know as an agency though, we've um, we've gotten a lot of negative feedback, especially from like our social media and stuff like that, where we've really had to monitor, you know, what um, what was coming in and, um, you know, blocking what, whoever it was that was making negative comments. Um, but I went specifically working with our parishes and community partners. I haven't really experienced that. Everyone has just been really eager to help um, and I think they wish that they could help more. Um, so I think it's just us coming up with new ideas in which we can engage them. Um, but personally, we, I haven't really experienced any of that um, in my line of work, but so far. But I'm sure it's you know it's out there, like I said. But um, yeah, well, yeah, this this is good to hear. That's been my experience by and large too. That. Um, um, in spite of the overall national trends and such that you hear, like in Washington and such, there there still is a huge outpouring, and it's more, you know, folks want to get engaged, folks want to welcome the strangers, but they're having a difficult time finding the strangers <laughs> because, <laughs> like, specifically with refugee arrivals, we have like such a significant reduction in refugee arrivals. So that brings me to my last question. Um, so with that, you know, with the decrease in refugee arrivals this year and, and likely to be continue in the next year, what are your strategies to keeping volunteers engaged? Because they, 
they they read the news, right? They, they read about the global crises, the 65 million and more counting, um, you know, uh, internally displaced refugees all around the world, and we're seeing fewer and fewer refugees actually arriving to, to the states. So how do you keep the parishes and, and other community volunteers engaged? I think uh, we kind of have, we've kind of had to switch our gears a little bit here of um, maybe, and we're just really trying to focus more on the education piece of, okay, you know, this is what the media is portraying, but here's really how a refugee arrives, you know, in our, in, you know, the, in Kansas or wherever, um, Ever, wherever they're resettling, it, that it is a long process. Um, it is a calculated process, um, and that um, it's just right now. It's just an education piece on our our, our end. Um, and I don't think we have volunteers that are um, really getting downtrodden or anything like that. I like I said before. I think they're eager to help and they want to help on a greater capacity and we just need to be more creative in engaging them and saying, you know, here's, you know, here's a new idea in which we can um, still continue to welcome those refugees that are currently here. So what can we do for those that are currently here and making them feel more a part of our community if we're not going to be, you know, resettling as much as we once did? Because, um, you know, there are still individuals that are here that are still needed assistance and help. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much, Camille. I think um, I, um, unless you have final thoughts or Tom, you know, who, if you want to wind, uh, you know, weigh in with some comments, uh, concluding remarks, I would otherwise turn it back to the moderator, um, Tom and Camille. I think one of the things we're proudest of, and that if there's a message from our program that um, that might be worth sending to all the other programs is that there are so many rural parishes that we've been able to make some kind of connection with, even though they don't have refugees specifically in their parish or in their city. Um, and so, you know, like um, in Indianapolis, for instance, there might, you know, most of the refugees are going to be in the city, but there are places all around there where there may not be any refugees, but there are still people willing to help. And it's really trying to find ways for rural or people who are far away from the front lines to still make a contribution. And, and that feels good and helps them to, to be a part of this process and, and a part of God's work. Wonderful. That is a great closing remark. Uh, thank you very much, Camille and Tom, for this little radio interview. With that, I want to hand it over back to... Allison, I believe, um, and thank you. Next slide. Uh, I'll jump in at this point. Jim Koo again, um, kind of a shameless plug here, if you will, but uh, like all of the Catholic Charities USA strategic priorities, uh, immigration and refugee services is seeking to develop a broad-based community of practice to increase the capacity within its uh, ministry network to uh, welcome and successfully integrate all newcomers, regardless of whether they're refugees, immigrants, whatever their legal status and the circumstances that compel them to leave their homes in search of a better life and new opportunity. They come to us as church, as parishes for help, and we, we help them on that basis. So by being counted among this community practice group, as we call it, you would have access to a variety of resources, webinars like this one today, uh, advocacy and networking opportunities. Uh, and the best part, it's free. There's no charge. So just by participating in today's webinar, your name and address will be added to our uh, growing community practice list. And of course, you can opt out at any time if you wish, uh, but we hope you'll find these in, this information, these kind of resources helpful. So with that, I'll... Turn it back over to, oh, no, I'm sorry. There's one other uh, infomercial or commercial here. Uh, that's on the uh, the CCUSA magazine that uh, you see in front of you here. This is the um, flagship publication of Catholic Charities USA. It, it's uh, published quarterly. 
You can see this particular issue from early uh, 2017, the spring issue, uh, dealt with uh, the issue of uh, welcoming the stranger. So um, we're hoping that um, you'll take a look at that, be looking in the future for other opportunities to, to uh, check out that particular magazine. And uh, one, one other opportunity that uh, some of the participants might be interested in for those who are parasocial ministers, either those based in agencies or dioceses or based in parishes, we would encourage you to sign up to receive the bi-weekly Catholic Charities USA parasocial ministry news and notes. Um, very simply, you visit the website, bottom of the page, um, and then select the um, parasocial ministry option that comes out every two weeks, including one to be sent tomorrow, which will feature the recording and the slideshow of this webinar. If you want to go over again some of the things that we have heard. Um, now, I'm looking at the time. It's 2.57, and so I think it's probably best if we wrapped up with our closing prayer, and those who wish to remain longer are welcome to do so, and all of us will be available to answer any questions. So I'm going to pass the baton back to Allison once again, who will lead us in our closing prayer. Thank you. We will conclude with our prayer that is the prayer for the Share the Journey campaign. Let us share the journey. Adonai, Lord and Master, many are the journeys your people have taken. Abraham's journey led from fear to understanding. Moses' journey led from bondage to liberty. The disciples' journey led from death to new life. Even today, your people journey, immigrants and refugees, pilgrims and nomads, searching for hope, searching for opportunity, searching for you. Lord, I know that I too am called to journey. Continue to call me beyond my comfort and into encounter. And when I meet a companion on the road, may we find you in each other's embrace. Let us share the journey. Amen. 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 And now for those who wish to remain, we will um, answer some of the questions that have been um, present us to us, presented to us. Um, one that has come in is, is there a link to the Catholic Community Services in Anchorage Warm Meals Committee Manual? Um, says the link provided appears to allow access to Manual 1. Um, actually, what I think is probably best for this individual is we can email her directly we have your email address, and I think that we can provide a um, direct link um, for that. Um, a another question is, what are some of the biggest mistakes parishes can make in seeking to welcome and integrate new Americans, immigrants and refugees? And I'm going to direct that to, uh, to Daniel. Um, first of all, to see what he has to say. What a difficult question. <laughs> Thanks, for, uh, <laughs> Thanks for passing this on to me. <laughs> <laughs> really hard to answer. Um, I guess I don't don't think that way. I, I'd like to, to frame the question uh, in a positive fashion. I, I would just turn it around and say, you have to first, you know, through trial and error, take a positive approach and try to first, um, you know, maybe build up capacity, taking it slowly, um, practicing, you know, praying, and eventually you'll succeed in planting the seed. But I can't tell you off the bat, you know, um, what really, uh, if anything has backfired on us. As I haven't seen it even. Like the power program, I guess the way we prevent this from happening is that we have a very organized approach. So there is a, an application process in place. We're asking, requiring everyone to think this through thoroughly as to how they want to work with parishes. And I think um, 
that's that's the key that the the recipe of success here is that you are you're doing that you're laying it out you're conceptualizing it you're putting it on a piece of paper and and you're not doing that without ha a prior contact right i mean everybody has contacts in the parish um so you you do know that you have existing positive work relationships and you have to work those and then go from Thank you, um, Daniel. I know that is a very hard question. Um, Jim, do you have anything that you would add on this score? Just recognize that no matter where people come from, whether refugees, immigrants, whatever, that they have the same goals and aspirations that we do. They come from different cultures, speak different languages, but that doesn't make them not equally uh, human, equally having dignity, if you will, there's a tendency sometimes, I think, without really trying to to be intentional about it, is to put ourselves in a bit of a superior position relative to the people that we're working with. And to just really try to put ourselves in their place. Think of yourself, if you were placed in the situation where the reverse was true, you were found yourself forced to be in, a, in, a, in an environment where you didn't know the language or culture, you're no less, uh, uh, you know, you know, competent, you're no less uh, intelligent, whatever the you know word you want to use. It's just they're they're a bit, bit out of out of place. So just to try to meet them where they are, treat them in, an, in sort of an equal uh, uh, you know uh, plane, and and deal deal with them on that basis. Because sometimes we tend to want to step in and just kind of do too much, or assume that they need perhaps more help than they need. But empower them to to realize your full potential and dignity as human beings. Wonderful. Thank you um, for that. And our, our final question that we've had um, posed to us, um, I'm going to begin again with you, Jim, mm -hmm. actually. Um, what are some of the, the greatest concerns or hesitations that are expressed by parishioners mm -hmm. when their parish um, in, in, intends to start welcoming new Americans? Well, I think in this current environment, I think uh, the, the question is often asked, well, who are these people? Can I trust what you're telling me about them? Particularly if they come from a Middle Eastern uh, country. Uh, so much misinformation is out there uh, about uh, people, particularly from that region, but from, from any country. Uh, that it's important that we try to first learn as much as we can about the culture and the people that we're helping and to try to dispel a lot of the myths that unfortunately kind of grow up around the populations that we serve. It's just, um, it, it is a bit of a struggle there. Um, and, but, you know, I, I, I believe that as people understand and get to know the people more and hear their stories, that's so important that they begin to realize that they are, gee, they are just like us. They have the same goals, same aspirations. They want what's best for their families. They mean no harm to our country, et cetera. So those are the things I would mention. Great. Thank you. And, and Camille, if you're still on, um, in, in your experience um, there in Kansas City, um, have you encountered any concerns um, or hesitations by parishioners in seeking to welcome new new Americans, and if so, um, how did you all respond to that? Well, um, certainly, this is Tom with Camille, <laughs> but our our agency as a whole, we're certainly in a conservative part of the country, and um, and we have we have dealt with a lot of concerns from permission from parishioners as an agency, but in our in our work meeting with people in the parishes it's rarely come up but i really think one of the things um that that really helps us navigate some of that is knowing a little bit about the situation um so sometimes people are like why are they refugees we didn't know that burma had problems but well, now everyone knows that but a few you know a year ago a lot of people didn't realize that or what is the issue in bhutan and being able to explain a little bit about the political situations there makes it more real, I think, for people. And I think that's one piece of information it's good for for people doing this work to be armed with. Thank you. That, that very um, 
important insight indeed. And um, Daniel, um, from your treetops perspective, is there anything you would care to add on this matter? Um, I think Tom and, and Jim really um, really explained it perfectly. Uh, perfect, really. Um, I think the only other um, point I would make is to remind folks also um, to look at demographics and the history of this nation, that we're a really a country of, of immigrants and that welcoming the stranger is in our genome, particularly for us Catholics, um, you know, that that's really and um and the um yeah, we'd be hurting us if we were if we weren't uh, uh hospitable and if we weren't um helping the welcoming the strangers Great. thank you um and we have one very quick final question and um daniel this will be directed to you the question is are there financial incentives for parishes to be involved in the power program? How, how does that work? Yeah, so that is a, a complicated question in the sense that really, um, I think what, what could be done is like if, if there's a parish that wants to get involved, um, and if you're really thinking this through, if you have concepts that you have available, if you have thoughts, ideas, uh, the first thing to do is really get in touch with the Diocesan Resettlement Office, which you can find through the UCCB Migration Refugee Services website uh, or directory. Get in touch with that Catholic Charities Agency that's administering the refugee program and see if you can form a work relationship, if you can do something where you know, maybe um, in the past, the, the programs I've seen where that's happened is that they've made stipends available to presenters, to speakers, to organizers at the parish level. This can all be worked out in, in the form of a budget. And um, so, like, for instance, I, I could see, like, in the past, I've seen parishes being special events, World Refugee Day gatherings, refugee supper clubs, as, as you know, Kansas, um, any kind of special outreach events where maybe parishes play um, a hosting role, a hosting, they have hosting re uh, responsibilities. But what the, um, the the grant application should then state, and that should be worked out, is that you are, um, that you're receiving, of course, um, that you're re being reimbursed for your efforts, if, if that's something that you, that you wish to, wish to do, wish to offer. Um, and beyond that, if, you, if there are any other things that you could do as a parish, um, in terms of um, you know volunteering, providing services to newcomers, work that out with your diocesan resettlement office, and and it can be written into the grant application. And I'm sure there'll be a way to reimburse you for for those efforts. Jim, yeah, I would just add, um, Daniel, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the power grants, as Daniel described, are really uh, to help empower the agencies themselves to have the resources to develop the parish resources. So in a real sense, the, the, the parishes are being looked at as, as a, uh, a resource or, or a source of cash and in-kind contributions coming into the refugee resettlement program, as opposed to the recipient of these power grants, which you know, really accrue mostly to the, uh, to the Catholic, Catholic Charities agencies. And so yeah, the yeah, idea that, correct, that yeah, this is a yeah. public-private par partnership arrangement between the United States government and the Catholic Church in this case, and as Daniel may have pointed out, that's that has actually resulted in in the amount of monies that are put into these power grants to enable Catholic charities to, to have these inroads or outreach into the parishes. That's garnered a four, five, six to one return, if you will, in cash and in-kind contributions that parishes bring to this resettlement effort. Yeah, that's an that's important clarification. So the, the emphasis, as Jim stated, really is uh, that we are working in close collaboration with those offices. However, I think my example was if like a parish wishes to take on a very significant role in this effort, like I, and that's happened in the past for sure, um, that you know they just work, in, work that out with the office, with the resettlement office, um, like say, you no, know, those like organ organizing a really big special 
can be quite costly. So if, if the parish took that on, just to pick an example, you know, there there might be, I mean, we would hope that a lot of this is pro bono and that this is a in-kind that's generated that that we can then report back as, as a tremendous uh, success and a tremendous contribution. Um, however, there there could be a way where I think we could, um, the, the program might wish to offer stipends or might wish to reimburse the parish for parts of their expenses. I'm, I'm sure that that's at least a consideration. Great. Um, and, and thanks to everyone who participated. I hope that this has been uh, useful information for you. Uh, may God bless all of you in your, your ministries and, and efforts. Everyone who did participate will receive a follow-up email tomorrow, um, and it will reiterate um, the contact information for all of our presenters. So if you want to continue the conversation, have any additional questions, um, you'll know uh, to, to whom to direct them. Um, so with that, um, we will sign off. And again, thanks to our presenters and thanks to all of our participants for taking a part of this.